So for 20, 30 years, you were the guy, you were the neuro-ophthalmologist in our tri-state. Right. Yeah, there right. were no other neuro-ophthalmologists, really. Or for most of that time in Kentucky. Right. The whole state. Are you still going there? Louisville. Still so, Louisville. yeah, so I do, I do, I'm a professor at uh, University of Louisville. I go down once a month, uh, lecture to the residents, and then see patients with the residents all day, and then drive home. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> um a lot of people have likened neuro-ophthalmology to, like you mentioned, like detective work. You're kind of like the house of ophthalmology. Hmm. No other subspecialty can figure out what's going on. They yeah, send it to you. That's true. And I know you're a huge fan of uh, monocular diplopia concepts. <laughs> yeah. What are some things you wish that uh, the referring providers would <laughs> often do or, or information they would acquire to send to you oh. before they send someone your way? Well, I don't know. I think I, I always tell the residents, you know, that there's really nothing special about neuro-ophthalmology. It's that you take a history. Um, which, you know, most residents, I think, say, what's wrong? My vision's blurry. Okay, let's look at your eyes. So the history part is the detective part, in part. I mean, that's part of it. But it's, it's taking a good history. Um, and I think the, 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 you know, our secret weapons can be color vision for people with bad vision. You know, the color vision's pretty good. It's probably not the nerve problem. But they're little, they're little things. I mean, they're, they're, and I have a whole talk on, you know, call it house without the attitude. Um, detecting difficult diagnoses of unexplained vision loss, basically where the patient has a normal exam, uh, but they can't see for some reason. So there's all sorts of little tricks and things that are not uh, sophisticated, I would say. They're either simple little things, um, you know, like a pinhole for monocular double vision, for instance. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that there are, the referrals, of course, come from a wide variety of docs. I mean, mostly optometrists, ophthalmologists, um, neurologists, and neurosurgeons, um, some family docs, and so on. And so what you expect, of course, is different depending. Um, and I, I do review all my referrals in advance. And sometimes I will say, get a regular eye, you know, someone's referred by a, a doc, a family doc, because they have heard my name. And, the, and I say, you know, get a reg this is probably glasses or something, get a regular eye exam. And if there's still a problem, let me know. Um, I don't know if there's specific things that, um, you know, I, I tell my, my assistants and my patients, I don't do headaches and I don't do dizzy. Um, uh, I definitely don't do monocular double vision. So there are a few things that are, you know, Dr. Gulnick doesn't take care of those things. Um, and there's, you know, there's plenty of uh, patients with, you know, real neuro-ophthalmology difficult problems that, that uh, need to be seen. Um, because there's still, you know, not really, there's certainly no one else in town that's doing full-time neuro-ophthalmology. One of our partners and former residents, Dr. Hansen, uh, Laura Hansen is doing uh, a little bit of neuro, but not, she's doing mostly comprehensive. So she sees some of the neuro stuff, which is nice. We get a lot at, uh, at the resident clinic. I mean, we don't have neuro-ophthalmology clinic that often there just due to time constraints and, and scheduling, but we get a lot of uh, referrals from other providers or neurology, neurosurgery specifically, needs to be seen by Dr. Golnick to rule out papilledema. Right. And we said, there's, if, we, if we put every one of those in neuro clinic, right. you would never leave. Oh, well, that's, that's certainly, if you want to talk about banes of my existence, that's one of them. Because, you know, a few years ago, somebody put an article in the radiology literature um, and said, oh, these are the findings you might, you're going to see more often in Increased intracranial pressure, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, you know, fluid around the optic nerve sheath, partially empty cella. But those are normal findings. The problem is anybody these days gets an MRI and the radiologist looks at the scan and says, oh, there's a partially empty cella. Um, this can be seen with increased intracranial pressure, correlate clinically. Oh, what does that mean? Rule out papilledema. What happens then? They call the, the, they call the uh, they, they say, oh, papilledema, that's neuro-ophthalmology. And then they try to get on my schedule. I refuse to see those patients. Um, I said, listen, see any eye doctor to rule out the papilledema. Um, I've never seen someone who went in for just a routine MRI for some totally unrelated reason who had those incidental findings who had papilledema. So I refuse to see those patients. It's just not a good use of, you know, a solo neuro-ophthalmologist in Cincinnati's time right. kind of a thing. Yeah, we put them all in our general clinic and we yeah. say, okay, if we see papilledema, Right, then or we'll... if there's a question, you know, right. then fine. If there's a question, I'm not sure. And if there is papilledema, I don't need to see them. Then let's, yes, they have papilledema, let's take care of it. It's amazing that there was probably only like one or two or three people who wrote that paper, put it into the literature, yeah. and now it's so yeah. widespread and, and it's affected 
ophthalmology well, across the board. Right. And the problem is that the patients also, you know, they read the reports or they are told, oh, you've got fluid around your optic nerve. Uh, you're going to go blind or, you know, something like that. And so they're all anxious and nervous about it um, and don't under, hard to understand. Well, wait a minute. They said on the scan, I had this abnormality. And so I have to explain to them, well, it's, it can be abnormal, but it can be normal, but they have to rule out this thing with your eyes to make sure that it's just a normal finding in your case. And sometimes it's hard for patients to understand that. And it depends a little bit on, you know, how that's presented to the patient by the referring doctor too. Right. 